If you want to build awesome UI animations, you need a super solid base of CSS. For me, building a layout can often be more difficult than actually animating it. So let's see the top six CSS techniques that I highly recommend before building UI animations. But really quick, before we get started, I am finally working on a Framer Motion course. I have put this off for far too long, but people have been asking, so I'm making it a priority. For anyone interested, I've got a waitlist site up in the description. Join that for a discount whenever I launch the course. Anyways, back to the video. So first up, we're gonna talk about absolute positioning. As a good example of absolute positioning when it comes to UI animations, I've got this grid hero section right here. And if you look closely, you'll see that we have these little beams. They kind of look like electricity beams of light that come from the top and then they beam down to the bottom. And in a situation like this, we need to be able to figure out how to actually place these beams so that they're directly lined up with our grid in the background. Now here is my thought process when going through something like this. First of all, we have our background image right here. This is just an inline SVG and this makes up our actual grid in the background. The reason that I'm pointing this out is because we'll see here that this is a 32 pixels by 32 pixels grid. So if we want to align something on our first grid line right here, then we'll need to offset it by 32 pixels from the left or 64 pixels for the second one and then same from the top. And we can see that we're actually doing that. So I have this constant right here that says grid box size, 32, as mentioned. Probably could have called this out earlier, but obviously I'm doing all of this in React and I'm using some Tailwind CSS and things like that. So if you're not familiar with those, try to think about this a little bit more conceptually, maybe than the actual JavaScript that I have written here. But with that said, essentially what I've got here is this list, this kind of uh, this array right here, and each of my objects within this array make up one of my beams. We'll see how that comes to be here in a second. But for example, let's say this second beam, what I'm saying is that I'm going to want to position this 12 grid columns essentially down from the top or 12 grid rows down from the top. So 32 pixels times 12. And then for the left, so how far I wanna go from the left, I'm actually doing that based on a percentage. And the reason that I'm doing that is obviously your viewport width changes quite a bit based on the screen that you're using. So then maybe for this third one, I'm saying that I wanna be three grid columns down from the top or three grid rows down from the top and then 25% from the left. If we actually look where this comes to be, we can look in my beam. All that each of these beams are is just a div that has a gradient. So essentially it just has a linear gradient that goes to the bottom and it's going from this blue color with absolutely zero uh, opacity to a full opacity of that same color. It then has a position of absolute as mentioned. And then we're just passing in those top and left stylings and that's how we get this really specific on the grid layout. Next up, I want to talk about sticky positioning and more specifically sticky positioning whenever we're using it in reference with a scroll animation. So as an example, I have this little horizontal scroll thing, and this is taking my vertical scroll and turning it into a horizontal scroll. But the same kind of technique could also apply to different parallax effects and things like that. Really, anytime you have some kind of scroll triggered animation where some element stays on the screen, it's generally using some kind of sticky positioning and it generally works something like this. So over here in my code, Code, I'm actually gonna comment out this content in the middle. So now I just have this gray box. And what we're gonna notice over here is the height of this box is 300 viewport height. Again, that's this, let's maybe make this a lighter color so it's easier to see. Let's just go 100, so now it's a white box. And we'll see I can scroll pretty far up and down in this box. Now the reason that I'm doing this is so that I can then add another element inside of this. So maybe say something like this. So now I have this kind of pink bar right here. Without sticky positioning, obviously I can just kind of scroll past it and it keeps going. But if I actually come in here and add a position sticky like this, and then set a top of zero. So if you're just writing CSS, again, that would look like this. Now, whenever I actually start scrolling, this is gonna catch with the top of this element and that will scroll all the way down to the bottom of this element at the bottom. And why this is useful is we can then use something like Framer Motion's use scroll hook to actually listen to the percentage that we've actually scrolled through whatever target reference we want. So in this case, this wrapping section right here with 300 viewport height, and we can turn that into some kind of animation. So in this case, I'm just taking those cards and I'm turning that into, I know it's gonna be a little bit hard to read, but essentially I'm just turning our vertical scroll into a horizontal transform. So if I add our original content back in and make this not look stupid again, then what I'm doing is you'll notice as I keep scrolling, essentially we're turning that vertical scroll into a horizontal transform or you know, it's just some other value for an animation. And that's how we end up with a cool effect like this one. So next up, and maybe a little bit more niche and specific, I wanna talk about the CSS calc function. So for this example, I have this cool kind of 
opening nav thing. And what I actually want to talk about more so than, you know, the rest of this animation is this hamburger menu that I have up here at the top right. So we'll notice whenever I click this, we have these three bars and then they kind of collapse down in on each other. And the challenge with building something like this goes back to our absolute positioning that we talked about a second ago. So this is kind of a custom hamburger menu. We have these three separate bars. We'll see the code here in a second. And we need to be able to position all of these in the right position so that they're kind of lined up. And if we just did everything 50%, 50% and then offset by some percentage vertically, I guess, then what we would end up having is this bottom bar and here I'll just show you we would end up having something let's see like this where everything's just kind of in a line now you could of course just figure out the exact pixel values for everything and that's fine a lot of the time but that could then cause issues if you wanted to change the size of you know this wrapping outer button or something like that and that is where css calc is going to come into play so taking a look at my hamburger button code right here this is kind of my wrapping button. Nothing that I would really care about too much here. If you know about frame or motion, you could take a look at how I'm handling my variants right here. So I just have open and closed variants. If not, don't worry about it. We'll see what's going on here in a second. But then I just have these three spans that make up my three bars. So if I just comment out, say this bottom one right here, then we should see that that goes away on our hamburger menu, just like that. Now, without going too far into the weeds of how this works with frame or motion, I know this is supposed to just be a CSS tutorial, but essentially we are, how we can look at this is that we're mapping some specific set of styles to whether or not this element is open or closed. So you can completely ignore the rotate and bottom right here. That's totally fine. But essentially the way that we can read this is for that bottom kind of bar that we have there. Whenever it's open, I just want to do a left positioning of 50%, which that makes sense, right? Because whenever we are open, this wants to be just directly in the middle so that it can then line up with the rest of the X. But whenever it's closed, we need it to be offset over to the right a little bit. And the way that I'm doing that is by saying calc 50%, which as we saw a second ago would just align it directly to the middle, but then I'm adding an extra 10 pixels of offset because this is a smaller bar and that is just going to push it over to the right, which then allows us to kind of line this up and change the size of the button and everything should kind of stay aligned. Calc, if you've never used it before, can also be used for, you know, all kinds of other stuff. So for instance, I have this absolutely positioned little overlay thing over here on the left or these little buttons over here and I'm using calc for those as well. I find calc to be super useful when I'm making say like dashboard layouts and you have a whole bunch of different boxes of specific sizes and they need to be able to scroll in different ways for things like that. I always generally go to calc, but when it comes to making complicated animations, it's generally in context of absolute positioning like this. Super quick call out just to say that all of the components that I'm going over in this video are available on my website. My website is hover.dev. You'll be able to find the source code for all of these in both JavaScript and in TypeScript. You can kind of just come over here, click TypeScript if you find whatever component you like, and then click copy. Use that code in your own projects. A lot of stuff is free, but I do have a paid plan for this as well. There really isn't a better way to support me than to go and check out Hover. But anyways, back to the video. So next up is transforms, and more specifically than just learning transforms is learning to mangle transforms. It's not really an easy thing to teach. It's more of just a thing where you kind of learn to build things over time. And transforms are probably the most common way of building different kinds of interactive components. So by example, I have this little carousel thing over here where you can click left and right, and it kind of stacks the cards on top of each other as they go. And the way that I'm doing this, you know, as you would suspect is using transforms, I guess really quick, we can just take a look at how transforms work and why they are helpful. Let me just comment out a bunch of this content and I'll replace it for the time being just with this little a H2 tag, and then just a random kind of box right here. Now, why we generally use transforms is we it allows us to kind of move things around the screen without actually affecting the layout of the flow, right? If that kind of makes any sense. So for example, I have this box right here, this red box, I can add a style tag to it, and I can then say translate, and maybe I want to transform it on the Y axis, oops, on the Y axis, let's say maybe 25 pixels, and I did that backwards. Translate Y, there we go. Nice, that is what I was trying to do. So he's using shorthands in frame or motion. But anyways, yes, so something like this. So now why this is useful, as I mentioned, is it doesn't actually remove anything else from the flow. It doesn't kind of damage the layout of the rest of the flow. It moves an element around, but keeps the block of that content where it originally kind of stood, right? So if I add another H2 below this div, and then kind of just change this back to We'll just remove it, I guess. We'll see how all of the spacing of this kind of lays out. Everything is directly next to each other. But whenever I add that transform back in, this hello world below this element stays in the same position, right? Like if we use a negative margin or something, it would also bump up the content below this box which might not be exactly what we want. So instead we reach for something like a translate. But anyways, looking back at our full example, you can get rid of that and uncomment all of this content. 
and now we're back to our little carousel here and the way that this works is a little bit complicated so let's see here we have our list of kind of different features those are hard coded down here so they each have a title and icon and a description that could just kind of you know make up each of these little cards and we're mapping over all of those and we're passing in the position or the the index essentially of each one of these so as we map over these the first one will be index zero then one then two then three and we're comparing that with the current position which i'm just storing in a piece of state up here so we start at zero aka when we haven't actually moved over at all our position is zero and then we're doing our translates based on how many times we've kind of moved over here so anytime i click this button right here on the right it'll shift me to the right which then just adds one to the current position if we shift to the left it does the opposite of course and scrolling down here is where i'm saying that you kind of need to learn to start mangling your translates because the way that this is going to work is going to be very specific to this exact use case right so if the position of or the current position rather is greater than or equal to the current index of this element so if we're on zero and index is zero then essentially we're just going to do index times 100 aka translate everything over by 100 percent or 100 pixels you just put this at zero really quick to see what that does we'll see when everything is at zero because this is just kind of using flex it all just goes right next to each other and if we put this up to say 20 everything moves to the left minus 20 everything moves over to the right but looking back at our logic now by default we'll just do index times 100 so the first one's not going to translate at all then the second one by 100 percent etc etc else if the current position is less than whatever our current index is then we need to do this kind of little mangled piece of logic right here that i figured out whenever i originally built this component but essentially this little bit of logic then being passed into our x translate again this is just kind of a shorthand that frame or motion gives us but this is the same as doing translate or transform translate x allows us to get this kind of stacking shifting card animation that looks like this next and a little bit simpler and hopefully a little bit less in depth than the last couple of examples but it's just getting really comfortable with z index and stacking contexts so for this example i have these little shuffle cards where i can drag a card and they go from top to the back whenever they actually get dragged far enough and the way that i've actually set this up if i scroll down to each of my individual cards so i have these different card components that each take in a different testimonial different author stuff like that all the content that gets actually shown on the card here and each of these are ordered or positioned based on this piece of order state. So order up here is front, middle, or back. And then each of these kind of map to different pieces of styling and those get kind of rotated whenever you actually shuffle, if that makes sense. So whenever you actually shuffle, so you drag this over to the right or you know the time comes and it shuffles. We'll remove the first item from our order here so like front and we'll move it to the back and then down in each of our individual cards so this starts at whatever the first one is so say front we'll then map to different sets of styles but most specifically what we care about here is the z index so z index starts as front and that will set our z index as two if it's middle it sets it as one if it's back it sets it as zero which then is what allows us to have this different stacking and then kind of shuffling of cards now what i'm saying here is not specifically that you should use this exact technique that I'm using here. I don't I kind of just made this up for this one specific example. But what I am saying is just getting really comfortable with manipulating Z indexes as there's a lot of different kind of animations and interactions that'll potentially require you to manipulate those. And even more so just getting comfortable with stacking contexts, which I do not have an exact example for here. But there are definitely a lot of times where you have a whole bunch of different elements on the page at the same time that all have different absolute positioning or different Z indexes or things like that. And maybe you're trying to get one thing to show up. You're bumping the Z index up to you know some really really high number you know maybe you have a z index of, on one of these elements of some really really high number and then some other element which you're trying to get in front of it as a lower z index but for whatever reason it's not actually showing up above that element and that is because of what we call stacking context so if that's not something that you've actually dug into at any point yet i would definitely recommend spending some time understanding how different stacking contexts are created and what that actually means but i'll leave that to you to do on your own time because that could be an entire video on its own anyways on to our last technique now for my last case i did just want to call out that sometimes negative margins actually can be pretty helpful i know that i called out a second ago that you'll generally use something like a translate as opposed to a negative margin because it doesn't affect the rest of the flow but sometimes you'll already be using your translate for something else and in some of those cases it may just not kind of matter you're not actually pushing anything out of the way and one example might be something like what i've got right here so the way that i set up some kind of animation like this is we have a wrapping box that already has a full border radius on it but it's actually this kind of gutter thing that you're seeing right here is the wrapping element around all of the other elements we then place all of these logos directly to the middle of this element so we can see what that looks like if we just comment these out like this now we'll see that everything is kind of squished down to the middle oops Yep, just like that, down to the middle. 
And this is working just because we have this grid on the outside that's placing everything to the middle, specifically like this text that's in the background or, you know, the logo or whatever. But then all of these other elements are just absolutely positioned already. And from here, we can actually figure out where we want to place all of these elements on this outer kind of circle. Now, in this case, I'm actually not specifically already using kind of a transform or something like that. I am using a rotate, but those could be kind of collapsed together with an actual translate. But there are definitely cases where those things do collide or they just don't even matter. So in a case like this, I already have this wrapping element on the outside and I just need to be able to nudge all of my elements out by some amount. Now, the actual logic that I have set up for how this works is a little bit complicated and not necessarily what I want to cover in this video, but it is helpful to know that your margin amounts can be negative and positive, and those will move the element in, you know, either up or down or left or right. In this case, for each of these, I'm placing them around this outer circle out here on the outside. But if we just want to do a single negative margin and then kind of refresh, we we'll just do say negative 50 top or let's do 250 maybe left and top. And now we'll see that all of those are placed kind of on top of each other. Obviously can't really tell just because one of them shows up on top, but it is just helpful to note that as a backup, it is totally fine to use negative margins or margins in the same way that you may use a translate, especially whenever you're using it with a position absolute, because then it's not going to actually be nudging other content out of the way. But anyways, that's about it for me for this video. If you got anything out of this, I would massively appreciate a like and a subscribe. Again, I have just started working on a frame or motion course and I have a waitlist website up in the description. So if you wanna learn how to make animations like these more in depth than I can cover in a single video like this, go and check that out. If you add your name to the waitlist or your email to the waitlist, you will get a discount whenever that launches. I don't have an exact date for when that's gonna launch just yet but I am about halfway done actually writing all of the code. Then I still have to film and everything. So it probably will be, you know, maybe two or three months, but I am hoping to make that the most in-depth animation course with frame or motion. I'm assuming it's going to be, you know, tens of hours long by the time I'm done with it. And we're going to go over all kinds of cool stuff. You can see more about what I'm planning on the actual website, but yeah, that's going to be it for me. I'll see you guys next time. Peace.